Good evening, folks, and welcome to the 31st session in the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to begin this evening by reading from Psalm 78, the first four verses, because it speaks a little bit to what we're going to be talking about tonight uh, in the section of Luke that we're looking at. Psalm 78, verses 1 through 4. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell them to the but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. So we're in a new section of Luke. Uh, this is our first time in the in this particular in the set of verses, Luke chapter eight, verse four through chapter nine, verse seventeen, which breaks into two sections that uh, we'll be looking at this evening. We're only looking at part one, verse uh, chapter eight, verse four through twenty one, which focuses on how one responds to the word of God. There's a call to respond or an onus to respond that's placed on us by Jesus in the passage that we're going to be looking at. The section as a whole, though, breaks into a pair of units that focus on hearing and then on authority. We're going to be looking at the hearing part of it this evening, the, uh, be, the be careful how you hear, which is the really the theme verse of chapter 8, verse 18, is the theme verse of what Jesus is trying to get across here as Luke is stringing some of these things together. And then next week, we'll be looking at the authority of the Messiah over all things, how Jesus displays his authority over the elements, over demons, over illness, and over um, being able to multiply food and feed large crowds, and even convey that authority to his apostles and send them out ahead of him, giving them authority to do the things that Jesus has been doing. There's, we're going to see a division here tonight, a division between the disciples and others, people who are listening to the words of Jesus, who are seeking to know more, who are investigating, who are trying to go a little bit deeper into uh, what Luke is, or what Jesus is saying, and then others who have a very superficial understanding, and they're there to see Jesus because he's the new kid on the block. He's the new thing in town. He's, people have said, here's a, here's a great prophet, and he's doing wonders, and they're coming out to see the show, if you will, but they're not letting the things they hear really penetrate into their hearts and make full application because Jesus is, he's, he's drawing huge crowds to him now. And not everyone in those crowds is coming out of a desire to hear Jesus and understand him for who he is. A lot of people are seeking the Messiah. A lot of people are hoping for the Messiah. But when they see Jesus, he's definitely not the Messiah that they're looking for. And so they move on elsewhere in their search. We have a couple of themes running through this larger section, but the part that we're going to be focusing on this evening that I'm going to read for you in just a moment is the theme of genuine hearing, which is woven throughout this entire section. Jesus is going to say in verse eight, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him truly hear the words that are coming out of my mouth and not just hear them, but act on them, be motivated to action because of what I'm saying. Uh, he's going to say later on in, in the chapter quoting from Isaiah that he's couching his language in parables, fulfilling what Isaiah said, that hearing they may not understand. There are going to be those who hear the words and don't understand them. There are going to be those who hear all through throughout the parable four times. He's going to say there are those who have heard. This is the how the parable of the sower unfolds. Those who have heard the word and how they've received it bears a little is a little bit different. And then verse 18, he says, take care then how you hear. 
which I think is really the the linchpin to everything that's gone before and what comes after. And finally, he draws the relationship between hearing and obeying and hearing and doing the word of God to being part of the family of God, being part of the family of Christ. It's, it goes beyond, the, the ties there go beyond that of blood ties, beyond the ties of ordinary family. So I want to read Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 4 through verse 21, and then we'll make a couple of observations from them in the time that we have left. Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 4. And when a great crowd was gathering, and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And he said, and as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard, are those who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while, and in a time of testing, fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience." No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Take care, then, how you hear. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. Then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. So this is a really, really familiar uh, passage of scripture, the parable of the sower, the parable of the soils, the parable of the seeds, however you want to uh, categorize it. I don't really want to go into and break down the elements of the parable itself and talk about the identification of the sower, the identification of the seed, and, and really dig down into that because I feel that that's ground that we have covered in other classes with other teachers more gifted than I many, many, many times. Rather, I'd like to take a look at some of the elements of the parable that we perhaps don't focus on quite as often and tie it into what Jesus is saying about the necessity or rather the importance of hearing and then responding because hearing is a thing and we're going to be making application in a, in a little while when we get to that section of the slideshow. Hearing is, or listening rather, I think is something of a lost art. There are many times when my wife will say something to me and I will hear that she has spoken. But if you ask me three minutes later, five minutes later, what it was she said, I'll give you this blank look because it did not penetrate this thick skull here. And uh, it has caused some interesting discussions in our relationship in that there was a time when I thought of myself as a good listener. Um, but as I get older, I realize that there's a lot more to listening than I have thought in the past. And there's, there, it, it requires a lot of focus. If I'm reading a book and you wanna tell me something, 
make sure that I put the book down because if I if I don't, I will hear background noise. Yes. Um, you could tell me if I'm reading a book and you could tell me that you're going to dance across the room juggling geese and I won't know what you said because I'm too focused on something else. And that's a point that Jesus is trying to make in this parable that if I'm going to hear the word of God, I need to really pay attention to it and, and listen to what Jesus is saying. Luke abbreviates this parable. There's, it appears in Matthew's gospel, it appears in Mark's parable. Interestingly, John's gospel contains no parables. Uh, Luke and the, the, the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke contain the parables of Jesus. And Luke is using this one parable as a catch-all for all of Jesus' parables and really focusing our attention in on what's being said here so that when we encounter others, he's already used the term parable three times in the Greek, but here he's, this is the first time he's really presenting one with Jesus saying, by saying Jesus spoke a parable saying, and Jesus is now talking about parables and their purpose. But Luke shortens it because I think he is, emphasis is on a different point his emphasis isn't so much on the parable and the and the interpretation of it but rather the response to it the reception of and response to it jesus is drawing enormous crowds lots and lots of people we've already seen this um earlier on in luke in chapter six the the, the crowds came to him to be healed and to hear what he had to say after he raised the uh, son of the widow in Nain, he, a huge crowd following him and a huge crowd coming out of the village with the widow and her dead son on the bier, they proclaimed that, that a great prophet has arisen among us. This was something new, the report of which reached um, far and wide. Simon the Pharisee heard of Jesus and his fame and invited him to dinner with him and in comes the sinful woman anointing Jesus feet that we talked about last week. People are coming out to see Jesus. They want to decide for themselves. Here's this one who is reputed to be a great prophet. They want to understand for themselves who this individual is. So we come to this parable of the sower some have tried to imply that the sower is kind of scarce, or not scarce, careless, because he's, he's, he's flinging seed everywhere. He's, he, it's like he doesn't care where it lands. And we've already talked about the indiscriminate goodness of God, as demonstrated in Luke, that God sends his rain on the just and the unjust, causes his son to rise. On the, on the righteous and the wicked alike. God is indiscriminately good. He's indiscriminate with the scattering of the seed. Jesus does not handpick those to whom he's going to preach the word of God. He's preaching it to everybody. Anyone who has a pair of ears to listen, he says, if you have ears, listen to what I'm saying. And so he, he goes about and he, he speaks to anyone and everyone who will hear because he knows that his word is powerful. He knows that the word of God is useful. If you look at Isaiah chapter 55, uh, verses 10 and 11, the prophet Isaiah says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall, it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God knows in spreading out the word and Jesus knows in spreading out the word that it's going to reap a bountiful harvest because the word of God is powerful. The word of God is effective to those who apply themselves to it because then it causes it causes bearing of much fruit it causes great growth in people the the word of god is something i think that because it's so available to us sometimes perhaps we take it for granted and don't um 
don't hold it in the esteem with which it needs to be held. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Moses says in verse 45 of Deuteronomy 32, and when Moses had finished speaking all these words to Israel, he said to them, take to heart all the words by which I am warning you today, that you may command them to your children, that they may be careful to do all the words of this law. For it is no empty word for you, but for your, but your very life. And by this word, you shall live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to possess. God's word is not like somebody else's word. It's not something to be taken lightly. Moses says, these words are your very life. Uh, Jesus says in John chapter 12, that it's the word that is going, the word that he has spoken is what is going to judge those who have heard. In John chapter 12, verse 44, Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. We've already covered this in Luke 4, when Jesus preached in Nazareth and read from the scroll of Isaiah, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, to get the receiving of sight for the blind. Uh, Jesus is uh, speaking about release and rescue, rescuing those who are sitting in darkness. Verse 47 of John 12, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given me a commandment what to say, and what to speak. The word of God is what judges those who hear and then say, you know, thanks, but no thanks. I, I don't need to, I don't need to be paying attention to this. I find it interesting back here in Luke chapter eight, the cadence of the rhythm that Luke is setting up here as he abbreviates this parable. He repeats the same phrase four times over. Some fell, some fell, some fell, some fell. Speaking of the word, speaking of the seed that the sower is sowing. But then he uses a different preposition with each of those phrases. Some fell beside. Some fell onto. Uh, some fell in the midst of. And then some fell into. Three of those refer to a response that is sort of at, at, at arm's length. The word falling beside means that it's over there. It didn't really reach me. It didn't really pierce my heart. It didn't penetrate. And so I'm going to leave it over there. And Jesus is going to make the application that they, these are the ones that Satan comes along and, and snatches the word before it has a chance to penetrate. Sometimes it falls onto, it's falling onto the stone. Stone is, well, the Bible speaks of hearts of stone and hearts that are hardened. The word can't penetrate. The word can't get any purchase there. It might start a, a it might begin to grow, but it, because it has no root, because of the, it, it can't bear up, stand up to the sun, it withers and, and dies away. Some fell in the midst of, and that's what I was talking about earlier, that the word is just another thing in our lives. The, the word is, you know, I've got, I, I've got, I'm going to go to worship and then I'm going to watch a football game and I'm going to have dinner and I'm going to, um, maybe watch a little bit of TV or something and maybe read the newspaper. And we treat these things as though they're all on, on an equal plane. Well, they aren't. The word should take precedence. It's not a thing that we can have in the midst of everything else in equal measure, but rather it needs to be that which is, has fallen into. It falls into the heart. It comes into the heart and it penetrates and we have an actual chance to um, embrace the word and, and grow in it. I think as Jesus is talking to these people, some are, have come out and they're not hearing the things they want to hear. 
Paul writes to Timothy saying that you need to take care because people are in the future going to gather to themselves people who will speak what their itching ears desire to hear. And there are a number of alternative, alternative gospels out there, alternative ways of being saved or at least uh, finding purpose in life or finding wholeness of being or whatever you want to call it that sound good to people that don't require as much work or as much effort as the gospel can require from us. Um, some are already looking for the next thing. And that's a, that's a thing I, I get caught up in sometimes. I'm doing a thing, but my mind is already on the next thing that I'm going to be doing. Rather than enjoying the moment that I'm in or focusing on the moment that I'm in, I'm looking ahead to what, it, what might come next. Some are too, are too distracted to truly listen. Is this an age of distracted people or what? I mean, it, it's funny to... I, I, when before COVID, before the time of COVID, when we'd go out to the mall, sometimes if, if we're out shopping in the mall and then we'll go into a certain store that I have no interest in, I'll go and I'll sit in the, the chairs that they, that pr the mall provides for you and just watch the people. And ordinarily you have people walking along and chatting and talking to each other or clustering in groups and talking, but now they're all like this head down, focused on what's in their hand, distracted and, and oblivious to what's going on around them. I am an oblivious person. I, you, unless something is plainly obvious and comes up and hits me in the face, I probably won't notice it. But sometimes I think I, I have risen above because people have not, because I've changed, but because people have lowered themselves down to becoming even more oblivious than I am. Um, some though have come out to hear Jesus they're hearing and they're understanding and it's these that Jesus focuses on because these are the ones who come to Jesus the disciples not the crowd the disciples come to Jesus asking for clarification now whether this is the the 12 or if it's the crowd of disciples that has been following Jesus I like I prefer to think that it's the crowd of disciples who are interested in what Jesus has to say and not just the 12, they come asking for clarification. What does this mean? You've spoken something to us and we're trying to feel around the edges of it to identify what it is. We're trying to figure out what these words that you're saying, how do they apply to us? What do they mean? Um, and Jesus is going to highlight how these, how these things are responses to the word, responses that individuals are going to have to the word. Jesus knows that not everyone he speaks to is going to receive his message. Uh, man's indifference does not come as a shock to God. God is fully aware that Many people want nothing to do with him or are too busy in their lives to, to have, pay any attention to him. And it serves to highlight our responsibility. The disciples come and ask, Jesus, what does this mean? Rather than sitting there in their puzzlement and wandering away because they don't understand what Jesus has said or this is a difficult thing and they, they can't get behind what Jesus has told them. In John 6, after Jesus has talked about being the bread of life that's come down from heaven and that his flesh is true food and his blood is, is true drink. In verse 60, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some among you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. So he's not shocked 
when people hear the message and then reject it. And in verse 66 uh, or verse 65, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. We might talk about that in a moment. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have come and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So they're coming to Jesus here with here back in Luke, they're coming to Jesus saying, we don't understand. Can you clarify this for us? What is it? What, what point are you trying to get across that we're missing? And I think this highlights uh, one's responsibility to respond to the word and our responsibility to be a part of the sowing process. God has called us to be spreaders of the word. He's also called us to take it upon ourselves to respond, to dig deeper, to strive and, and, and grasp and struggle for understanding as we walk and, and grow in our walk. Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 3, verse 37, or 27, rather. When I speak with you, God speaking to Ezekiel, I will open your mouth and you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, he, will, he, who, he who will hear, let him hear, and he who will refuse to hear, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. That was said of uh, Israel in exile, that could be said of us now. He who's going to hear, let him hear. He who's going to refuse, let him refuse, because the world in general, are a rebellious people. There are going to be those who hear. There are going to be those who refuse. Simeon, when he received Jesus in the temple in Luke chapter 2, turned to his mother and said in uh, verse 34, Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointing for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. Those who hear and reject are going to fall. Jesus has already said, my word is going to judge them. Those who hear and receive and put God's word into practice are the ones who are going to rise. There's a division being made. Simeon mentioned that there was going to be a division there. Jesus is going to be the sign that is that is opposed because people who are looking for a Messiah are looking for a political leader who's going to lead them in battle against Rome and throw off the yoke of oppression and reestablish Israel and set, set Israel up as a, as a kingdom, um, an earthly kingdom. And Frank mentioned it in his class last night, even on the Mount of Ascension, they still didn't understand. They still didn't fully comprehend what kind of Messiah this was that they were dealing with. They were looking for the earthly. Jesus is speaking about the spiritual. And it's not something that comes to you just in, just in a flash like that. It's something that grows. Understanding grows slowly. And I really appreciated the, the point, Frank, that you made last night, that it, it took Peter years from being Satan and saying, no, far be it from you, Lord, that you should go to a cross to then writing in the epistles of Peter, that deep understanding that he gained. But that deep understanding wasn't gained that day. It was gained over years of walking and ministering and serving God. And that's really what Jesus is driving at in uh, verses 16 to 18, that understanding comes, but it comes slowly. Uh, understanding is one of the things that, that, uh, we grow in slowly. He starts, though, first in verse 16, saying, no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar, puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that they, those who enter may see the light. We've already seen a verse like this in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Does Matthew's application apply here? Does it fit here? I don't think it does. I think Jesus is saying something else. In Matthew, he's talking about doing good works. 
before others that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Here Jesus is talking about responding to the word. Here he's talking about how one receives it and how the word is manifest in their life. How one hears is eventually going to be made manifest. Those who hear the word and put it into practice and grow in it, it's going to become evident in their lives. You're going to see the word of God working itself out in other indivi in an individual's life. They're going to begin to bear fruit. It may not be immediate because if, if you plant an apple tree seedling, it's going to take years for that to grow into a tree that bears fruit. And in our Christian walk, I think the same thing applies. It's going to take time for us to begin to bear fruit to the scale that Jesus is talking about here, bearing fruit 60, 80, 100 fold, bearing fruit and growing deeper in our understanding. Nobody opens up the Bible for the very first time, turns to the book of Revelation and reads it from beginning to end and says, I've got it. I understand. No, that's something you, you, you come to late and you apply yourself and you take your understanding from the Old Testament and the images that John is using and use that to interpret the symbology that he's talking about. And even then, I, like I said, when I taught Revelation, I know what I know about Revelation, but I'm not telling you that I know everything about it because that would be a, a rather silly thing to say. Parables are not meant to obscure the truth. Jesus didn't come to hide the truth. Jesus came to be light, to shine the light of God's truth into the hearts of those who are receiving him. But some people are going to block it. They're going to be obstinate. They're not going, they're going to refuse to listen because it's not the message they want to hear. And I think both of these here, how one hears being eventually manifest and um, Jesus' word as light ties into the theme in verse 18 where he says, take care then how you hear because how you listen is going to become evident to all. Uh, Bill Moore is involved in trail life. I have not set up a tent since I was in high school, I think. And so I'm a little rusty, a little fuzzy on it, let's say. So if I were to ask Bill Moore, you know, he hands me a tent and I were to ask him, well, how do I, how do I set this tent up? And Bill tells me how well I listened is going to be manifest in whether it looks like a tent when I'm done, or if it looks like a really bad lean to with a little bit of fabric flapping in the breeze, how you listen to the word in the same way, how you listen to the word is going to become manifest in how you live your life. Does a person reflect Jesus to the best of their ability, to the best of their understanding in their life, or are they reflecting the values of the world? It's fairly obvious when you spend time with people. Also, the word is available if only you will attend to it. That's the flip side of the coin where I said, it, sometimes I think having the word as, as available makes people take it for granted, but it's there. The word is there. It's there and available to us and we can reach out and, and grasp hold of it and work toward understanding it. He goes on from there to say, for the one, for the, for to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. Um, Proverbs says, give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9. Jesus speaks in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Hungering and thirsting after the things of God. Uh, he, he says later on in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7 and verses 7 and 8 to, to seek and you will find. Ask and it's going to be given to you. Knock and the door is going to be opened to you. God doesn't turn away the one who seeks in earnestness. 
uh, as, as, as Paul went from Thessalonica down to Berea and the people there received and, and dug into the word to see if what Paul was saying was, was true. They were seeking. God doesn't turn away the one who seeks, the one who's seeking with an open heart, not going in with a preconceived notion of I'm going to find verses here to back up my particular theology. And once I have them, that's what I'm going to hold on to. Uh, I've seen people who, who've done that. And I, and I write here, uh, rereading the Bible and discovering more. How many of you on your fifth, sixth, eighth, 20th time through the Bible find a verse you've never seen before? <laughs> They're there. They, they've always been there. But for some reason, and I think it's the Spirit doing this, I honestly do, it's showing us something that maybe we weren't ready for before or we weren't ready to understand before. Uh, now, having spent time in God's word, enough time in God's word, now it clicks. Now it stands out and says, hey, here I am. I've always been here, but you haven't, you haven't been ready to understand this. You haven't been ready to receive this. That's the, that's the fascinating thing about rereading God's word. I'm, I'm a reader. I love to read. And there are books that I reread and reread and reread, fiction books. I don't discover new things in reading those books. I mean, things that I know the story really, really well. But in this, in, in God's word, I'm always finding something. There's always something new, something amazing that'll jump out uh, to me. And I, I think that Jesus here is saying, the one who has, the one who receives the word and holds on to it, is going to get more of it. Because if I understand this piece, then I can take that and apply it to these verses and maybe open those up as well. And suddenly the understanding begins to flower and it begins to bloom. And, and, and here comes the fruit that you're going to bear forth in the understanding of the word and in the sharing of it with other individuals. One of the commentators uh, I read, uh, I, I have his name at the end. Um, it, it's it's uh, Craddock, Fred Craddock in the interpretation commentary says of these verses here, the three sayings in these verses are good commentary on all the parables. The first saying reminds the reader that even though parables require some initiative and responsibility from the listener, Jesus' purpose, there should be an apostrophe there, was not to conceal, but to reveal. The second likewise underscores the conviction that Jesus came not to keep secrets, but to bring to life what had previously been unknown, the reign of God and the nature of life within that reign. Jesus, we've talked earlier in chapter five about Jesus ushering in the new order and the Pharisees wanting to cling to the old order because they're saying, putting the new wine into the, into the, into the old wine skin, they're saying, well, we've tasted the old wine, the old wine's good. Why do we need this newfangled thing that you're bringing us? We're going to hold on to what we have, what, we, what we're comfortable with, uh, better the devil you know. The third saying reminds the reader, however, that Jesus' parables do not bless all alike without distinction. Those who lean forward to hear, who invest trust and commitment, who come to the altar of the word, seeking, asking, and hungering, these are the ones to whom more will be given. <coughs> Likewise, those who think that they already know, who acknowledge no blindness, who listen with ears that register only likes and dislikes, who fold the arms across the chest waiting to be convinced or entertained, who want information without obligation. These are the ones who discover painfully that even what they thought they had has been taken away. I really liked that summary statement of these verses here. Um, I worked with a guy in Utica when I was working in the restaurant there, we would talk about Christianity and Christian values and truth. And he would do that. He would fold his arms and, you know, say, okay, convince me, show me, prove it. Uh, he wasn't listening. He, or at least he was listening combatively, if you can do such a thing. Uh, he was listening, listening antagonistically because he did not want to hear. Because with hearing, genuine hearing, comes responsibility. I have to act on what I've heard. 
uh, if I'm reading through the Bible and I come across something that, that highlights something to me that I need to make a change in my life, I can't just gloss over that. I have to respond. Either I'm going to make that change or I'm going to ignore it. But with ignoring it comes, comes some consequences. So we get to the last little section here in verses 19 and following. Then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. So is he classifying his relatives as outsiders? I really don't think so, because we know that his mother and his brothers uh, were faithful. I mean, you've got enough writings from the brothers of Jesus to, to show that. I think rather he's highlighting the, the, the bond shared by the faithful through the word that sur supersedes that relationship. I think of Shirley Brown, um, who says that when she came to Christ, she had to sever ties with her family and that her church, the, the church family was her, was her family. And she had closer relationships to people within the church than she ever did within her physical biological family because they were ties through the word of Christ. And that creates in us a bond that I think is stronger than uh, the bonds of familial relationships. I think of David Owens. David Owens is a dear, dear soul to me. He wasn't always. When he and I were punk kids at Camp Hunt, we were pretty strong rivals. Um, anything he could do, I tried to do better. It's interesting. People go out to Camp Hunt with the goal of, of you know, meeting their friends or, or learning about God or growing deeper in their faith. I would go out with the, with the goal of just beating David Owens at a track and field event. And uh, David, if you ever watch this video, you know the truth of what I'm saying. But somehow that bloomed into the relationship that we have now that is, it's, it's a deeper bond than a blood relationship than a family relationship could ever be. Uh, the, the respect and the, the love that we have for one another. So Jesus says, my mother, my brothers, there's the relationship tie. The ones who hear the word of God and do it become brothers become children, become members of that family, have ties to Christ that are, are covenant ties, are strong, strong ties. So Jesus says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. So how's your hearing? Um, sometimes I, th I find this challenging. I, I don't know about you, but... I, I go to, I spend time studying Luke. I spend time studying other books. I spend time, as, mu as much time as I can here in God's word. Um, I listen to the Bible. I listen to audio Bibles. And uh, I haven't done it yet this year, but it's the next book in queue for me in my, in my listening schedule. And I admit, sometimes I zone out on it. Uh, you get into the book of Numbers when each of the tribes is presenting their offerings for the tabernacle. And, you know, day one, this guy brings 12 lambs and 12 rams, and he brings his plate with the flour on it. And, and then the next day, the, the tribe, the next tribe brings the exact same offering. And I'm wondering to myself, why couldn't Moses have condensed that and said days one through seven, every, or days one through 12, everybody brought the same offering. And here it is, boom. And sometimes I'll just sort of tune out. And it's, I worry that I'll do that in other sections of God's word, that I, that something important, uh, I don't know who it was who said familiar scripture needs to be read more closely, but boy, that's true. Um, times when you need to really focus in on what God has to say to you. Uh, I, I make the point here, six seconds to boredom. When I was in ACU, 
and we were in studying mass communications. And one of the classes I took was uh, television production and performance. One of the teachers of the class said that on your average sitcom, and understand that this was 1981 maybe, so it may have changed since then. But in your average uh, television show, the camera angle will change every six seconds. Because if it doesn't, people get bored. And that makes me wonder about the attention span of people. Do you, people talk about the attention span of a goldfish? Do we, do we beat the goldfish? For, for a lack of attention span or lack of focus, do things have to be that new and that vibrant and that changing in front of our faces? Otherwise we lose interest. It could possibly speak to why the success of the, these mega churches are so successful. They're putting on a show. They're entertaining. They are, they got the laser lights and the smoke pots and the, and the, the rock band and their full of charged emotion and, and excitement and enthusiasm, but where's the word of God in it? I, I wonder, it, I, I have a book on the bookcase behind me against the far wall, it's called Showtime, unless I loaned it out and somebody else is reading it. I think I might've loaned it to Don English, that speaks about the danger of turning worship into an event, that people come for the event rather than to come and kneel at the feet of their father and to pour out their adoration and their praise to him. And the uh, last point that's read that there referenced the tyranny of the urgent. Uh, Charles Hummel wrote a little pamphlet in the 60s um, with that title, The Tyranny of the Urgent. And it had, I, I think originally had religious applications, but it's, it's been sort of absorbed into the uh, business world. The people have their to-do list but sometimes something else will break into that and becomes urgent in our lives and diverts our focus away from the things that we're trying to focus on that are important. And he makes the point of saying that when that happens, these other things that become urgent grab control of us and exercise authority like a tyrant demanding all of our attention and all of our focus on this thing over here that's on fire. Um, metaphorically, not literally. Uh, if it was literal, then Bill Moore would get all excited. Um, focusing on this thing instead of what's important. And I think Satan uses that tactic to divert us away from focusing on God's word. He'll dangle that shiny bauble or this, 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 Thing that becomes more urgent that, that we think needs our attention now and in the long run it really doesn't matter at all the is this the last slide that this is the last slide to the one who has more will be given i think the christian walk is like anything else that needs practice and consistency uh, the, the more we practice, the more time we spend in, the, in God's word, the better we get, the better understanding we gain of it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it takes years for a tree to go from seedling to fruit bearing. I remember being a young child, I'm talking seven, eight years old, sitting in the pews of the Schenectady Church of Christ, watching Andy Ritchie preach and thinking to myself, boy, I'd love to do that. Well, I wasn't ready at six or seven years old. Come on. That's something you have to grow into. And the gifts that God gives us, he expects, he expects us to grow into and grow in our use of them. Um, hopefully, I'm a marginally better teacher now than I was when I first started. Um, and hopefully you and the exercise of your gifts have grown in that exercise, have grown in those gifts and grown in how you use them and how God is using you to benefit and better his kingdom. Next week, we will be looking at the last bit of this, uh, starting in verse 22 from the calming of the storm, all the way up to just before Peter uh, confesses Jesus as Christ. This will be the single most uh, number of verses that we cover in a single class, if it happens. 
Um, those of you who are betting people might want to bet against it because <laughs> it hasn't happened very often when I've said, oh, well, we're, we're going to cover it. We're going to cover a, a large chunk. Let me stop the recording and then we'll open up for discussion.